party tonight. What? TV party tonight. Oh, we got nothing better to do than watch TV and have a couple of brews. Don't want to talk about anything else. We don't want to know. We're dedicated yes. to our favorite shows. Oh, my circuit. Everybody loves hip photos. Gary Dog. Dancing at Blurred Ball. Futurama. Good evening. You are listening to a Rad Religion Broadcasting premiere podcast, TV Party Tonight. I'm your host, the mandated reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Radilage. And tonight, our favorite show is Transformers, the War for Cybertron trilogy, Kingdom, the conclusion to this glorious trilogy brought to you by AllSpark, which is Hasbro's production studio, and Netflix, and a bunch of other ones. Joining me as he has on the previous two episodes, is Cole Marintet, the film twit. How do you do, sir? I'm doing well. How are you doing, sir? I can't complain. So you and I talked about uh, these first two parts here. I think, you know, the first one was a nice little introduction, kind of getting us back for people who are a long time, like yourself, long time Transformers fans. This was, There was a lot of fan service. There was mm -hmm. a lot of, um, I was thinking about it today. It was kind of like, Somebody just gave a kid every single one of the Transformers ever made and was like, here, do stuff, play. <laughs> <laughs> we'll film it and see what we get, if it's anything usable. Um, and then the second one was a little bit more, a little bit more structured, a little bit more, um, a little more esoteric. There was you and I, especially uh, myself, used the term acid trip once or twice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And then uh, we were, but we were both saying like, when are they going to get to Earth? Like they called the second chapter Earthrise, and like they, you know, they only get to Earth in the very last second of the of the sixth episode. Mm -hmm. And we're finally here, Cole. We're here. We're on Earth. Mark, I have thoughts about this show. <laughs> well, I God, want that to be known. Goddamn, pal! <laughs> I don't want to stop you. Uh, where would you like to begin? Um. Well, I mean. It's a trope that everyone mm -hmm. says that a show ruined their childhood. And I don't personally believe in that idea. I don't believe that a, a show can ruin my childhood. Beast Wars is right upstairs. I've got the DVDs. I can pop them in whenever I want to. Okay. When I say that the characterization of the Beast Wars characters in this threatened to ruin my childhood, I want you to understand where I'm coming from with that. You're going to have to take my hand and walk me through this, because let me first say that my knowledge of Transformers, as we've talked about before, when we talked about the comic books and these past two television shows, I am obviously a child of the 80s, and so I am familiar with the 80s cartoon. Right. I am very well familiar with the movie. Our commentary of that is up in the archives. I did not watch Beast Wars at all. Okay. So tell me about Beast Wars and then tell me where this program touched you on the Beast War. <laughs> okay. So one of the coolest things about Beast Wars, as far as I'm concerned, was it really mm -hmm. added a depth of character. You had characters with their own motivations and it was more than just let's sell some action figures. Okay. Uh, you had a, a villain who's, wasn't just making a plan every week and the heroes come in and save the day and he goes, Oh, I'll get you next time. Maximals okay. in Megatron. So, Megatron's goal was to gather enough energon from earth to get back to Cybertron. What was the goal for Megatron in beast wars? Uh, the goal for Megatron in beast wars was to uh, basically surpass his namesake. He wanted okay. to, uh, he, Came to Earth. Well, they didn't know it was Earth at the time, but that's. Mm. <laughs> um, he came in search of Energon. He came in search of something called the Golden Disc, which plays into this. Mm -hmm. um, and he came in search of power. Okay. And the Megatron in the original Beast Wars is a very conniving, very forceful, very determined kind of character. And here's. Okay. Here's exactly where they touched me on the Beast War. Yep. You meet Megatron in this, mm -hmm. and he might as well be Starscream. Yeah, as soon as you started to explain what the Megatron from Beast Wars was like, I was like, oh, I know where this is going. 
Yeah, he's very much like a fanboy of of. Okay, we we have to figure out how to differentiate the two of them. So we're going to say Tank Megatron and Dinosaur Megatron. Works for me. Cool. So he's very much like starstruck by Tank Megatron in this, mm-hmm. and he never quite get pa- he never quite gets past that. Right. It's always everything in the show in the six episodes that we meet these characters and are dealing with them. Everything is in service to I want to impress my hero. I want to impress my hero. I want to impress my hero. Right. Right. And there are other characters that were not done as much of a disservice. Uh, mm-hmm. The Maximals, for as much as they're in it, <laughs> are um, fine for the most part when they mm-hmm. show up and their first instinct is to scrap the arc for parts. That kind of hit me the <laughs> wrong way. Yeah. Um, but they're fine. Uh, Dinobot, they did a pretty good job on. They played on his classic turncoat nature mm-hmm. um, okay. in the original beast wars dinobot was kind of the he was set up to be the star scream of the predacons and then in like episode two he's like peace out and joins the maximals <laughs> okay fair enough um let me uh kind of like i said i've never watched beast wars my first impressions of these characters having no foreknowledge of it because i didn't know if they were done right or done wrong is optimus primal is that his name is that yes Carilla? optimus yeah. primal big dope in this show yeah that's that's another big problem i had because he was not to keep harping on oh the original show did it better but Mm -hmm. in the original show the maximals are scientists basically the maximal ship is the enterprise they're these scientists who are out in space exploring learning new stuff to bring it back to cybertron and share their knowledge okay um and they happen to be the only ship in the area when Megatron performs his raid and they kind of get caught together and end up on Earth. Okay. So nothing like what is presented as the plot in this one where this is some sort of crazy time travel scheme. Well, it is a crazy time travel screen scheme, but that is something that you find out much later. Okay. All right, well, let's get into the specifics of episode one here. And I do have a plot synopsis because as I learned from the previous two episodes, if I don't have a working plot synopsis, it's going to be me looking at Cole going, what the fuck, dude? I don't get it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So funneling through Earth's atmosphere upon its descent, the nemesis begins to burn up quickly. Given the speed at which it is traveling, the rapid descent causes chaos on board. The Decepticons are aboard are thrown about the bridge. Moments later, the nemesis crashes amid a jungle somewhere in the Earth's surface. (coughs) Megatron receives visions moments later in which uh, he sees Galvatron with a golden disc. He has been summoned by Unicron and swears he will find Megatron once again. Megatron worries following the vision and believes the only way to keep the Matrix of Leadership safe is to tie it to his chest with a bandolier. Um, As you do. (laughs) As you do, yeah. Having been badly injured during the crash in the Ark, the Autobots slowly begin to awaken. Optimus Prime is surprised to hear from Wheeljack that they have landed in close proximity to an active volcano. Their ship has also sustained critical failures from the crash landing. The situation becomes increasingly worse when it is discovered that Optimus Prime is leaking Energon. He's assur- he assures Ratchet that this will not make a considerable difference to their efforts. After a thorough inspection of the ship, Wheeljack informs Optimus that their ship isn't completely damaged. To which uh, Optimus instructs Wheeljack to get the repairs done as soon as possible. And Wheeljack then turns into Scotty from Star Trek, speaking of which. The Autobots are are further surprised when they are attacked by numerous animals from Earth. Working together, they are able to defeat the animals, which comprise of cheetahs, tigers, and gorillas, but are surprised when one of the animals reveals itself to be Optimus Primal. Despite efforts by Prime to distinguish themselves and any and deny any involvement with the nemesis, Optimus Prime is reluctant to believe them and asks to see the Matrix of Leadership as proof. Uh, Prime is unable to do so, however, as his wounds begin to worsen. Wandering through the jungle, the Decepticons find themselves affiliated with numerous other Decepticons, Predacon, Megatron, and Dinobot. Um, the Predacons show Megatron his golden disc, to which he is surprised but relieved. All right, so... Um, What did you think of this first episode? I absolutely hated it. Okay. Like, a taste of things to come, my opinion softens. 
but as a first instinct, as a first, uh, a first step into kingdom, there was very little of this episode that I enjoyed. Yeah. I'm going to be honest with you. The ha- first half of this lost me almost instantly. Like, mm-hmm. I re- like, again, I have no affiliation with the beast wars thing. And that was a lot of injury. Like we got to introduce the beast wars and what their central conflict is. And when they, when they do in, 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 in this show, it's not that interesting to me. Like, I don't really care. Mm-hmm. Um, and the characters themselves are not that interesting to me. Mm-hmm. So, so much of the first three episodes is laden with their stuff that I don't care about. Um, and the central mission of we, we're here to find the all spark. I was like, well, get, fucking get there already. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. <laughs> so um, the only other thing that I, the, the one thing that did hook me and that I was interested in, and they kind of make some, Hey, out of it later on, but I don't know. I feel like more could have been done with this, and I think it all. I think it was also kind of a more interesting story when they when Megatron finds out that his entire li- life has been recorded on disc, and he now he knows the future. He has the sports almanac essentially. Yeah, and so he's able to outmaneuver the Autobots for a couple episodes because he knows. Which I don't want to get into time travel physics, but it doesn't work that way. <laughs> 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 um, but for the sake of this conversation and the show, their contention, the, their conceit is Megatron will always be able to win because he has the answers already because he has them on that disc. And that in and of itself, I at least thought was an interesting hook because so far it's been hot potato with the all spark and the matrix of leadership. And I kind of just want to like resolve that already. The other thing that's introduced early on here is the looming threat of Unicron, which I thought I was I was listening back to Justin Thomas on the mate on the uh, Transformers commentary. I don't know if you had a chance to hear it, but he made a point of telling me several times on that episode and then several more and more after that, <laughs> that in the in the toy that they did, in fact, eventually make a Unicron toy. And they also made a transforming Cybertron toy. Yes, that's true. And I thought where we were headed, our glorious conclusion was that Optimus Prime was going to, in a last ditch effort to ta da, save the universe, slam the All Spark into Cybertron, who was going to transform and punch Unicron in the face. <laughs> you know, the way things went in this series, not that far fetched. <laughs> um,. Yeah, they did at one time release a uh, a transforming Cybertron, which turned into Primus, who is right. the Transformers God. So you could have little Planet God in your uh, in your collection as sure. you do. Um, but no, uh, that is not <laughs> where we went at all. No, sir, not at all. All right, so episode two. Um does not have a synopsis. God damn it. Hang on. <laughs> I got you. Oh, thank God. Give me one moment. Um, while you are pulling it up, I will tell you that the wiki says, Megatron acquires an advantage in locating the AllSpark, the Maximals mount a rescue when the Predacons capture one of their teammates. Okay, Cole, what do you got for me? Okay, I posted it in the chat for you so you can follow along. Yeah, ready? Uh, in a possible future, Black Arachnia and Dinobot await their leader, the Predacon Megatron, as he steals the golden disc. Maximal enforcers fire on him in hot pursuit, causing Megatron to drop the disc. Black Arachnia catches it, and the two threaten to shatter it. Megatron implores them not to, claiming it's the only chance the Predacons have to take back their world. In the end, Black Arachnia agrees and relents, giving the disc back to Megatron, much to Dinobot's, not much to Dinobot's chagrin. You know, it's funny. I went on this site earlier, and I and I'm I'm glad you were able to find it because I could not find the plot synopsis for this. Uh, let's see here. Um, on Earth, Dinobot catches Starscream and Black Arachnia quietly scheming. Before he can intervene, Thundercracker reports that Soundwave has captured Air Razor, Maximal Spy. Uh, skipping to the end, uh, at the Ark, Optimus Prime and Primal argue priorities. Prime wants to stop his Megatron from ar- retrieving the All Spark at all costs, while Primal is keen to rescue Air Razor. Maximals are especially loath to lose another comrade, having arrived on Earth with a full complement of 200 soldiers. Prime and Bumblebee agree to help the Maximals, and RC is instructed to assemble a strike team to retrieve Air Razor alongside the Maximals. 
In exchange, Primal orders Rhinox to remain with the Autobots to aid them in their search for the Allspark and to repair the Ark. After they depart, Rhinox, Ratchet, and Wheeljack struggle to repair Teletran 1. The tech-savvy Rhinoceros Maximal stuns Wheeljack with his rapid progress. Learning that the Ark has passed through the dead universe, he states that doing so is an option he would not recommend. Uh, the two Megatrons discuss the contents of the Golden Disk. Beast Megatron warns his ancestor that too much knowledge of the future can be dangerous, but the Decepticon leader says he knows just enough not to know where th- to know not only where the Allspark is, but what he must do to retake it. Uh, Starscream eavesdrops on their conversation, reporting to Black Arachnia. We're not there yet, but when the bit where Starscream get uh, is able to get a vision of Unicron and then has foreknowledge of the future. It's probably some of the best stuff of the entire six episodes. Oh, totally. Oh, like, yeah. The, they backloaded this series with some good stuff. Yeah. Um, so the one thing that stands out about me about the second episode was whatever the uh, air racer, I think her name is. Yeah. She ends up getting caught, but it's but it's a false flag kind of a thing. She's perfect. It was one of those. And, and before I describe this as like this feels sometimes like a child just playing with toys and they and they recorded it and it was like, yeah, that's all good shit. Let's 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 run with it. Right. This was one of those where like, well, she was supposed to get caught and now everyone's got trackers on them. Ta da. <laughs> uh, like, I uh, <laughs> I have to be honest. I was mad like I was big mad that Air Razor got taken out by laser beak in Is episode one. Not consistent with the show. Oh man, Air Razor is this cool, like, spy ninja assassin kind of character. And she gets mm-hmm. taken out by Soundwave's pet bird. In defense of that, over the course of cartoons and movies and this show, Laser Peak might be the most powerful Transformer next to Unicron. That's true. That is true. <laughs> he's, a, he's at least the most successful Decepticon. Yeah, I, I I was not having any foreknowledge. I was willing to buy it because Laser Beak apparently is awesome and the most powerful ever. <laughs> um, she's the Ray Palpatine. Never mind. Um, moving oh on. dear. <laughs> oh dear. Mark, I have thoughts about those movies. <laughs> but that's not what we're here to talk about today. Oh no, that that, that that's a therapy session for a different day. Um, <laughs> so yeah, not a whole lot to I, I again. I wish they had done a little bit more with with Megatron. See, my my problem with the Megatron characterization at this point is, we st- one of the things we talked about with season one was how was what a complicated and well developed character Megatron was. Right. Um, that you could see his point of view, and that really the struggle within the Transformers was the struggle between two warring philosophies, not necessarily a battle between good and evil. It kind of becomes that over time. Um, and and here's the thing. I was thinking about like other characters who lose the plot. Um, they, they lose their sense of self and it just becomes about completing the mission. And, you know, and then gradually people fall away from them because everyone starts to realize that that character has gone off the deep end, mm-hmm. which is where I thought they were going with Megatron. And they don't necessarily do that. Um, you have a little bit of that with Starscream. But everybody else is just kind of along with Megatron for the ride. And by the same token, also, I'm getting a little tired of whiny Optimus Prime. Oh, Optimus, my God. Optimus Prime it, it, it has the biggest case of depression I've ever seen in a Transformer. Everything is always his fault. Yep. <laughs> I'm a, I'm Optimus Prime. I'm a fuck up. <laughs> Everything is my fault all the time. I can't do anything right. And it's like, dude. <laughs> okay. For a hero character, a little bit of self doubt, and you know, in terms of fleshing out one's character is okay. They go overboard with Optimus Prime. Above and beyond and to the moon and back is this guy's uh is this guy's self doubt. Um and at the end of the day, you know, you think about it, you think about what occurs over the course of the three series. Mm-hmm. And I mean, he does end the first series by making the most spectacular screw up <laughs> ever. Here, mm-hmm. let me just. Uh, oh <laughs> crap! Yeah, I was thinking about that. Didn't this all start with they need the all spark in order to rejuvenate Cybertron because it's dying, and 
the Decepticons are trying to get the all spark because if they do, they'll turn it into a weapon. And so Optimus Prime chucked it through the space bridge and they was like, well, now we got to go get it. And I'm like, and I was thinking about that. If, if I'm not wrong about that, I was thinking about that today. I'm like, wait a minute. That whole thing is stupid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it really is. I mean, I get, I get the idea that, well, we can't let the Decepticons have it because they'll turn it into a weapon. Okay, fine. That's cool. Mm-hmm. But it's also the only thing that can save the planet, and you just chuck it into space, and you have no idea where it's going. Right. Like, wouldn't have better thing to have been is to put it in a place where Megatron just can't get it? Right. I mean, you're <laughs> you're Optimus Prime. You can win this fight. Just keep it safe. <laughs> just put it in put it in a little box. Put it at mm-hmm. the back of your base, and then beat up Megatron. I was gonna say, wouldn't have made wouldn't have made more sense if they had learned about the All Spark in in the Jedi ancient texts. And they had to go off planet to go find it. Like it turns out yes. it's on Earth. Yes. Not it's on Cybertron and they just kick it <laughs> into left field. And it's like, well, I've yeah. got to do this or we don't have a show. <laughs> <laughs> so the movie can happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's it's funny because I don't think either one of us it like it, it occurred to us in the when we first talked about this. No, nope. but it, it definitely as I was thinking back on it, I'm like, wow, this whole thing has been about having to get the all spark that they had in epis in the first six episodes. Yep. Okay. It's a little convoluted. Anything else about episode two? Uh, let me take a look if there's anything important. Uh, we get a cool fight scene between Mirage and uh, Astro Train, where Mirage masquerades as Astro Train to fool the. Uh, Predacon Scorponok. Mm-hmm. Um, that was pretty neat. I like the use of, of Mirage's powers. Um, they've done a really good job of using his abilities over the course of the series, his uh, illusions. I agree. Um, we see Dinobot beginning to soften and uh, start to come over possibly to the maximal side. <laughs> and I have to look around my cat. Um. I will tell you while you're searching for thoughts, Black Arachnia might be my favorite character in this entire six episodes. She's series. so good. Yeah. And she's she, in keeping with her with her original incarnation too. She's one of the like the, the two or three. Yeah, they they this isn't all bad. They did a good job with her. Um and she actually has a really <laughs> so I had a couple of thoughts regarding women in Transformers. These are going to sound like funny thoughts, possibly, maybe even irritating thoughts. But these are thoughts that I had, and these are just sort of um, just, just going to vomit these thoughts out. So, stream of consciousness—that's the phrase I was looking for. I don't know. <laughs> Transformers don't produce milk. I don't know why the girls have boobs, but they do. Yeah, uh, <laughs> they very distinctly have boobs. Like, yeah, all right. Um, I get it. We're, we're, I get the audience. I get what we're doing here. I, I. I Get, we want to normalize this to some degree. I accept it. It's just a funny thought to me. Um, the other thing, and I was thinking about RC, and there were some tones about RC that were ringing for me. And I just sort of said, eh, I'm probably reading too much into this. And then later on, Black Arachnia, I, um, it, it's not RC. It, she ends up being saved by Air Racer. Uh, and Black Arachnia goes, my hero, and gives her a kiss. Yeah. <laughs> totally and that's that's total left field and i was like oh okay that's a thing we're doing all right whatever and and, uh, and like i said i don't i don't care in, in in terms of like i don't have an issue with it um I, it's not even one of those like weird place to put it because as, as i say people exist in the world representation matters etc cetera, etc cetera. um it just struck me as it just that and there were some like and I, and I can't put my finger on what but there were some like gay overtones with RC that I was like what I huh <laughs> you know and, and I'm like okay cool I they don't do anything with it so it doesn't really matter but they, they were there at least in my eyes um in the moment that they allowed her to have a character oh okay so, whatever yeah yeah RC. <laughs> RC has done a grand disservice by this series um, in, but it's, it's only a disservice in the eyes of someone who's read the comics and whatnot, because mm-hmm. if you follow the, like the cartoon, RC has really never had a character. Yeah. She's always just sort of been princess Leia. Yeah. She, well, no princess Leia had a character. Mm. The, she, she has been generic girl bot. Right. Good point. 
Um, and that's why, like, and, and look, if you, if if somewhere in the back of some writer's mind, RC's gay, I'm like, that's fine, right? Um, but they don't a don't really do anything with it. B, um, that's not a character, right? <laughs> that's a facet. You can build right. a character around that. Right. But yeah, that that's is, what I was getting at. That's not a character. Yeah. <laughs> like, your character is you're really manipulative, and you have a good way with people, and you, you, you're you a trickster. Okay. And your character, like, you're brave in the face of danger, but you tend to throw yourself headlong into things and get the people around you in trouble, and you're gay. Wait. No. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's... No, that's that's a building block of character, not the character itself. Um, all right, rant over. Episode no, three. I totally get it. All right, episode mm. three. Let's uh, go. On Earth, the treasonous trio of Starscream, Black Arachne, and Dinobot search for the Allspark. They use information about obtained via eavesdropping on Megatron and his golden disc to guide them. Unfortunately, their shuttle malfunctions, causing them to crash like you do. <laughs> As Dinobot awakens, he finds himself lost in a strange cyber forest full of glitching flora. As his comrades bicker about the crash, Dino... By the way, this is like the best stuff of the whole series. It's oh, just, yeah. This... this, Yeah, totally. They're inter Bl Starscream, Black Arachne, and Dinobot all interacting and wandering through an enchanted forest. I, I, I just want to show based on that. Um, Dinobot investigates the bizarre plant life. Black Arachnia pulls them back at the last moment as the glitching images before them cause the ground to quake and a great structure slowly emerges. Starscream transforms and scrambles away into the air as Black Arachnia uses her wedding, webbing to hitch a ride and carry Dinobot along. Meanwhile, a team of Autobots and Maximals led by Optimus Prime and Optimus Primal. Sorry, I know that you love Beast Wars, but that fucking name. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> it's it's not the best. It's it was a callback, and it doesn't work when both characters are together. Yeah, um, are conducting their own search for the All Spark. Prime contacts Bumblebee for an update on the Ark's repairs. Fearing the worst, he asks his second in command to lead the Autobots in the event that they fail to retrieve the All Spark. Okay, I need to stop there because I have fucking problems with that. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I understand Bumblebee is like the most popular Autobot you know, in the history of Autobots outside of Optimus Prime. I get yep. it. Yep. You wrote him as a ne'er-do-well scrapper who didn't take a side. Yep. He doesn't get to lead the Autobots. Nope. <laughs> that was, and that's the thing, is that was a cool, a cool um, diversion of his character from what he's usually portrayed as. Right, he's, he's usually like a prime like, loyalist. Right, he's usually the kid-friendly... You know, he's the bot that hangs out with Spike. Yeah. And they go and have wacky adventures, and then the rest of the Autobots come by and yeah, and save he, the day. He's your point of view character that as a child you can project on because he's not enormous. He's you're right, he's very kid friendly. So, you know, you as a child like look at him and he's not totally the power fantasy, but he's he's just enough you're like, I could be Bumblebee, sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't give him any kind of arc like that in this story. It's not like he started off as an heir to well and he's trying and he's on the hero's journey to where the end of it, he will become Rodimus Prime. Right. Because that's Rodimus Prime's story. Right. <laughs> Here, it, it's like, I'm shitty. I'm shitty. I'm with the Autobots because I don't have a choice. I'm still shitty. I'm going to lead the Autobots. Yeah, there's, there's a disconnect. It just sort of happens. And mm -hmm. I believe I physically double take. I took did a physical <laughs> double take when Optimus was like, "You Bumblebee will have to lead the Autobots." Right, and I'm like, R R "Really? <laughs> Him? How not, did Ironhide not kick Bumblebee <laughs> squaw in the balls? <laughs> not not Ironhide, not Ratchet, not Wheeljack, not right. Hound. I mean, Hound is right there. He's not a great choice, but he's a choice. At least he's a military <laughs> vehicle. I'll, I would have taken that. <laughs> okay, just based on their transformations, we've got an ambulance, we've got a van, we've got a race car, we've got a Volkswagen bug, and an army and an army jeep. <laughs> I'm just saying. First president of the United States was General Washington. Uh, I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> Leading but no. a small battalion of uh, of troops. Sometimes maybe you go to the military guy. Go on. <laughs> it was it was very bizarre and out of left field. Um, By the way, did it not annoy you as a child 
that they gave Hound this really cool missile launcher on his shoulder, but when he used it, it wasn't actually a missile launcher. It was like it's just little lasers. Yeah, I was like, wow, that's a that's dumb. The very they also very very rarely used Hound. Yeah, Hound show. wasn't Hound wasn't around very very often. Um, he was kind of because I did recently watch G one, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Um, <laughs> Doesn't hold up, eh? <laughs> I I have fond memories, but like <laughs> when you're watching it as an adult, as a piece of entertainment, you're like, oh, okay. So this is how they sold me toys. Okay, so I want to preface this by saying I have not watched Revelations. I have only seen the national conversation taking place among the nerds. Oh, and, neither have I. So, um, so I don't have a position to take on it. I understand there's very little He-Man in the He-Man show. That's the big complaint, among other things. But I know that there are people who are very upset about Revelations because it's not a reflection of the show they grew up with. But I'm here to tell you that in recent years, while I've had children, so between 10 to 7 years, I have watched He-Man. It doesn't fucking hold up. No. (laughs) When you're in your 40s, He-Man sucks. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's, there's something to be said about nostalgia. Yeah. There's something to be said about reconnecting with those things that you loved when you were a kid Mm -hmm. and then you 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 sort of relive those childhood moments but at the same time you have to divorce yourself from those and look at them critically yeah and it's like those 80s cartoons you may love them and that's fine you're okay to love those cartoons but love them as what they are they are toy commercials and and i would say to even go beyond that the things that entertained me when I was seven aren't as entertaining at 45 years old. Right. And if you're still entertained by the things at the same level that you were, I, that's good on you. But I know I aged. Yes. <laughs> I, have, yeah. I have definitely somewhat matured between seven and 45. And I'm sorry, the shit that appealed to me when I was seven doesn't quite appeal to me that way anymore. Not not to get off on a complete tirade. This is why like I don't get as excited about wrestling anymore because it was great when I was a kid. And Japat and I have been going back and looking at past WrestleManias and like and I'm reflecting on how much joy that brought me, but it doesn't bring me the same level of joy anymore. And I don't care how many times Kenny Omega throws himself off a cage and blows himself up. Right. It it's not going to. So back to Transformers. Um I just like the the, the G one cartoon was great when I was a kid. What rewatching it as an adult, which I've done that too, and I'm like, oh, this was never meant to be watched by forty five year old. Got it, <laughs> right? There's Moving a certain on. level of magic that's lost. Yeah. Um, episode three, as we were talking. Yes. Um, I got completely thrown off by the and you will lead the audio bots, child. <laughs> Wait, what? Um. Anyway. The two leaders talk. Prime wonders why Primal called him Nemesis and telling Primal about the golden age of Cybertron, which had become a mere myth in Primal's time. Elsewhere, uh, Megatron, Soundwave, and Soundwave conduct their own search. But Megatron has a key advantage with the golden disc. He has access to his future self uh, thoughts and can pinpoint the AllSparks location directly. Suddenly, the voice of the golden disc becomes that of Galvatron. And Megatron is suddenly surrounded by sparkless bots as Galvatron taunts him. But this turns out to be another vision from the Matrix. Megatron is stunned, but rejects Soundwave's concern about what effect the Matrix has on him and fails to notice the Matrix growing brighter, an energy that Optimus Prime can sense, giving him a way to follow Megatron's trail. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that in, in an attempt to sort of solve the He-Man problem, which is essentially give the people who are lifelong fans, give the 45-year-olds who are watching this everything they ever wanted about this, just put it all in there. They focused way too much on the, on the Matrix of Leadership and the AllSpark. I like, do. Okay. I do. Um, I think that the Matrix of Leadership and the AllSpark are fine MacGuffins. Like, they serve mm-hmm. their purpose. But you don't make a great show by having a cool gadget. You make a great show by having deep characters and by having respect for those characters and telling stories about those characters in a compelling way. Because the, 
the thing for me was not the matrix of leadership, all the Arshbark. The, the thing that fascinated me about Megatron was Megatron's quest of in, for independence. Mm -hmm. That's his driving force. That's what makes Megatron interesting. And that his sort of Scrooge moment, you know, his ghost of Christmas future moment was the realization that all of his actions lead him to become a slave of, uh, of Unicron. Mm -hmm. That's fucking good storytelling. It is. That's, that's great characterization. And that's the story I wanted to be told. Not why is the beeper I'm carrying constantly beeping at me? <laughs> and just going back to something we had touched on earlier, sort of a, a, a taste of how things could have been. You mentioned the interplay between Starscream, Dinobot, and Black Arachnia. It's these three characters whose motivations and loyalties are in question. Mm -hmm. They don't trust each other. They don't trust the people who they work for. And that leads them into compelling circumstances. That leads them into um, having this little mini adventure in the middle of the story that is some of the best storytelling that Kingdom has to offer. Yeah, this we're we're, we're going to talk about this at the end, but I can say it right now this is a very uneven series mm -hmm. because some of it is some of the best stuff. I mean, it's a Y seven show, so you know you have to I think couch your criticisms in the set that this is meant for children, not to middle aged adults. Right. But, <laughs> but here, but that's who watched it, so that's what we're talking <laughs> about. Um, because um, shit knows my kids didn't watch this. Uh. <laughs> But I, you know, for, for a show that's got some limitations because it is for children, there's some stuff in here that's absolutely some of the best TV I've watched this year. And then there's some stuff that is so bad. I'm like, I did you think about at all what you were doing here? And it's so weird that in a show that probably didn't get a tremendous amount of studio interference because this is not like a $200 million, you know, Marvel picture. Right that it's that they kept losing the plot so many times and that it almost felt like there's a you know there's a writer's room and there's somebody at the table going i have these really cool ideas for a story and they're like yeah yeah, yeah do that do that but the kids the the, the, the middle-aged white man on twitter are gonna want this so throw that in there too and it's like ah you're you're, you're messing with the broth here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it definitely there definitely felt like there was some sort of interference. And mm -hmm. for once, I don't think, like you said, it wasn't in studio interference. It was the interference of we have to, at the end of the day, this is a nostalgia project. Yeah. So we have to bow to those people who are going to be drawn in by the nostalgia rather than telling a good story. We need to tell the story they want to hear. Yeah, for sure. Um, so getting through the rest of this plot synopsis, suddenly a misty energy field begins to radiate through the forest. All the search parties brace themselves for air razors, flight systems malfunction, sending her plummeting to the ground. But the field seems to have passed through them harmlessly at first. Then a series of strange events occur. Prime sees the figure of Alpha Trion. Uh, this is, yeah, this is where they all start to see the thing they love the most. Yeah. Who yeah, turns to walk do. away. Yep. Uh, RC sees Cog, Sideswipe sees Sunstreaker. Uh, Starscream finds himself in possession of a crown. <laughs> I was like, wow, dude. <laughs> that was uh, that was certainly a callback. Yeah, that boy, was, wasn't ever. It was like, all right. So, yeah, you brought in Unicron. You had to. I understand. Is, is, is a stripper going to pop out of the TV and give me a hand job while you're at it? <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Could you get any more fan service? <laughs> <laughs> um purple crown and cape uh he has become a king that is until died about wax him in the face dispelling the illusion even black arachnia find herself anxious seeing wolf-like faces in the mist dinobot is unaffected and forces the other two to see through the illusions as dinobot mocks starscream's power fantasy the seeker angrily lashes out and punches him to the edge of a cliff receiving no support from black arachnia he is sent over the hills into the woods uh, Dinobot recovers and continues his search alone. He comes across the prone body of Air Razor. She turns out to be real, not an illusion, and he confirms that she helped him free from his Predacon past, but ironically has no choice but to stop Megatron from reaching the allspark of any of them are to survive. He transforms into his Velociraptor form and darts towards his prey. Air Razor follows him, but Dinobot wards her off, saying her injuries would only distract him from his ass. This was good stuff, too. They had a really good interaction here. Yeah, they definitely did. And, um, 
the uh, I just want to point out again. This is a Beast Wars fan. The Black Arachnia Wolf thing. That's that's a specific callback. Okay. So I appreciated that she ends up in the original Beast Wars. Uh, she joins the Maximals too and ends up falling in love with a Maximal named Silverbolt, who is half hawk, half wolf. Okay. So I saw the wolf faces and I was like, oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> okay. So I just had to point that out. Dinobot soon encounters Ravage and Laserbeak, making quick work of them, but he soon faces Soundwave, who sails the Raptor with Disruptor Waves. As Soundwave approaches the besieged Dinobot, he falters as the Cyber Forest glitches at his feet, and Dinobot seizes the opportunity, hurling his sword through Soundwave's chest. That was a rough, rough kill. Yeah, that was that was pretty dark. But Dinobot barely has time to retrieve his sword from the unconscious Soundwave. It's only a flesh wound before Megatron sucker punches him. I got Dinobot <laughs> The arms fall off. Um, Dinobot responds in kind, transforming into Raptor mode and slamming Megatron into the ground. The shock jostles Megatron's arm compartment, and Dinobot lays optics ugh, on the golden disc. Can't just call it eyes, huh? No, nope, Seeing... no, it's no. <laughs> Seeing that Megatron is so close to collecting the AllSpark in addition to the Matrix um, and the golden disc, Dinobot transforms back to robot mode and engages the Decepticon Gladiator in a mortal duo. Dinobot takes full measure of Megatron, criticizing his wild, undisciplined attacks. With a single well-timed strike, the enraged Megatron is bested at last, and Dinobot prepares to deliver the killing blow. But Dinobot is ambushed once again, dun, 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 this time by Beast Megatron, who viciously mauls Dinobot and severs his arm. Now critically wounded and facing two Megatrons, Dinobot makes a last-ditch effort, firing at Megatron with his optic beams. The attack worked, and, May and the Matrix is knocked from Megatron's chest. Beast Megatron... Tends to his son namesake as Dinobot escapes with the Matrix. Slumping against a tree, Dinobot can no longer withstand his wounds. He speaks to the Matrix, imploring it for help. As if to answer, the Matrix emits a beam in the distance right into Optimus Prime, dissolving the illusion of Alpha Trion. Prime, Prime finds his way to Dinobot and retakes the Matrix. Raising it overhead, the Matrix lights up like a beacon, giving quiet happiness and awe to nearby Autobots and Maximals. At last, Prime returns to the Matrix, the Matrix to his chest and kneels next to the dying Dinobot, offering him his comfort and thanks. The other Maximals and Autobots arrive. Having earned their respect and admiration, Dinobot confesses that he had considered joining the Maximals many times. Prime said he would have been welcomed. Primal, rather, says he would have been welcomed. With a pleased expression on his face, the uh, Dinobot finally succumbs to death. Didn't turn black, though. Didn't no, black. he didn't. It's kind of a bummer, seeing as we do everything else, you know, fanboyish here. Right, Exactly. Uh, the Matrix within Prime suddenly glows, meaning a beacon towards a mysterious structure in the Misty Forest. He recognizes the structure as the All Spark itself. All right, your thoughts on Episode Three that we haven't already talked about? Um, I Episode Three was when it started to turn itself around for me. Um, yeah. At the end of like, I got to the end of Episode One, and if it wasn't for this very show, I probably would have tapped out and not finished watching the series. Really? Okay. Yeah, Episode One was so so bad in my eyes that I almost, I almost quit. And like I said, if it was not for, well, I already said I would watch kingdom for the show. Mm -hmm. I'll finish it up. Uh, I owe it to Mark. So thank you for making me do this. All right. Uh, before we, <laughs> before we move on to episode four, I just want to remind everybody that one of our great sponsors here on the rattle and broadcasting network is Grammarly. Grammarly's AI-powered products help people communicate more effectively. Grammarly helps you write mistake-free on Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and nearly anywhere else you write on the web. Grammarly corrects hundreds of grammar, punctuation, and spelling mistakes while also catching contextual errors, impro improving your vocabulary, and suggesting style improvements. To download Grammarly today, go to getgrammarly.com slash W2M network. Again, it's getgrammarly.com slash W2M network to download Grammarly for free. Yeah, um, I would agree with you. Three begins the turnaround. Four, five, and six are when it became very interested in what was happening. I got to be honest; those first three episodes were a slog for me to get through. Mm -hmm. And at twenty-two minutes a piece, it's a lot to say things are things are a slog. But I was kind of like on my phone, like I like the, searching for the All Spark was not that interesting to me. There were definitely, as we've talked about already, there were definitely really fun character interactions, character motivations, the stuff with Megatron, as I mentioned before, and his sort of Scrooge moment. Um, you know, with Galvatron and all of that, that's all good stuff. The actual like searching for the all spark, I'm like, I oh my god, can we get there already? Like, mm -hmm. you know, 
the the thing of it is is they've been dealing with the all spark every single episode of every single part of this series now for three seasons mm -hmm. like i'm i'm a little like get there already and so yeah. we get there finally it's time to time to pick up the pace guys you're you're bringing up the end here let's let's wrap it up all right, episode four. On Earth, Optimus Prime rushes through a forest, singularly focused on reaching the Allspark before Megatron does. A group of Autobots and Maximals wait behind after Prime tells them that only he can access the Allspark with the Matrix. Air Razor, Rat Trap, and Cheetor disagree with Sideswipe, Prowl, and RC about the importance of the Allspark. RC challenges them. If the Golden Disk was worth the lives of 200 Maximals, the Allspark is, is more so. As the Maximals look to Optimus Primal for guidance, they find that he's gone. Swinging through the forest, he arrives behind Prime, who stands behind before the Allspark Temple, when the figure of Alita One emerges. Elsewhere in the forest, a cloaked Starscream prepares to grovel to Megatron and beg to rejoin his ranks, when Black Arachnia resents, presents another option. Stop cowering before Megatron and seize control of the sets comes the hard way. As she reveals a weapon to Starscream, Beast Megatron silently watches the pair from afar. Optimus approaches Alita tentatively with his weapon drawn. After cryptically repeating everything he says, Prime realizes that Alita is in fact a manifestation of the Allspark. As Prime attempts to run into the Allspark and for it forces him back, cryptically vowing to protect itself from its nemesis. As the Allspark takes the form of Ultra Magnus, Prime attacks its projection with all his might. The Allspark uses the very ground as a weapon, but Prime declares himself as the Matrix Bearer, which finally brings an end to the, to the hostilities, to which I'm left wondering, how did the Allspark not realize that's who that, was that all it took? Right, it's, it's, you just had to say it. I mean, you couldn't, yeah. the Allspark couldn't tell that that's the, the, that he had the Matrix. Prime just had to say, oh, by the way, I, I have it. Oh, okay. Well, who's, in that case, who's got the matrix? This guy. Oh, oh well, I'll walk this way. Well, that's a horse of a different color. <laughs> yeah, really? Like that? Really? That's it? Like, why are you fighting him then? It was almost like in you know in first pass there wasn't enough action in the first two minutes of the show. Yeah. So they're like, like, well, we'll have him fight a giant spider, um, <laughs> or polar bear, whatever it was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 anyway, um. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Pi Prime uh, ponders if Cybertronians and the Allspark have a sim symbiotic relationship. The Allspark once again chooses Alita's form as a projection, and she collapses into Prime's arms. Nearby, Primal himself encounters an apparition, that of Dinobot. Primal expresses his frustration that he's not impressed with the Allspark's illusions and that he just wants to get the Allspark back to Cybertron. But the spirit responds and claims to be the real Dinobot. Primal follows the ghost, not believing its supernatural nature. The ghost claims that soon it will join the Allspark. <sighs> Primal doesn't understand and tries, yeah, neither do I, to block its path. But the ghost passes through him, causing Primal to see Dinobot's life flash before his optics. Having now convinced Primal that he is truly a Dino, that he's truly Dinobot, the ghost changes to a beam of energy and heads to the Allspark Temple, exhorting him to keep fighting with the Autobots. Megatron, still searching for the Allspark. You know, if you want to get blackout drunk, take a drink every time they say Allspark in these synopsis. Oh my god, you die. You would die yeah. by episode three. Encounters as Ultra Magnus projections of his own and battles it. As Beast Megatron rushes to his lead to inform him of Starscreen's treachery, Megatron waves him aside and appears to fire his fusion cannon at nothing in particular. But in fact, he has shot a cloaked Starscream. His exact location was specified in the Golden Disk. He steps on Starscream's arm, forcing the ejection of Shockwave's uh, cloaking chip from his wrist. After Megatron equips the cloaking system, Black Arachne arrives and is bewildered about how Megatron could have targeted him while cloaked. While Starscream laments the lack of the golden disc, Black Arachne finds a pool of Megatron's energy, Energon from an earlier battle. She adds it to a canister and notes that the golden disc only responds to Megatron's energy signature, which they can now produce with the Energon sample. Prime listens to the Allspark describe its journey through space and learns that it passed through the dead universe. It even claims to have seen something called a dead multiverse. Yeah, the next, the next line in the synopsis is very important. The next line in the synopsis is Prime doesn't understand. And yeah. brother, neither do we. And again, this was made for fucking children. I don't... Right? <laughs> Look, my son's not dumb, but I can't imagine him like getting through this. We're like, nope, I'm out. <laughs> like, I'm gonna go watch YouTube. Um, That's it. 
That's it. Markiplier's on. <laughs> uh, but he knows that journeying through the dead universe can damage one's mind. Thus, he radios Rhinox and has him transmit a signal that deletes dead universe data. He applies the data upgrade to Alita, who falls unconscious, who's always falling unconscious, it seems like. Yeah, I mean, that's just kind of her thing. It's seen, in the same moment, the Allsparks temple door opens at last, and the Matrix shines a light inside the dark structure. Prime recalls the Allsparks' words, only he who holds the Matrix will be seen, but does not see the cloaked footsteps behind him. Inside the temple, Megatron and Prime are face-to-face, at last, Prime taunts Megatron for using such a passive approach to gain entry. Megatron claims perfect knowledge of the future and knows that he will win the All Spark. So I had a moment here. Yeah, it was very Bill and Ted this 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 whole bit because like Megatron's like I already know what's going to happen. I'll win when you drop your gun. And I and like at any moment I kept waiting for Prime to like just drop his gun. You know, right. like ah, but I set up a bucket of water above your head. Splash. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay, um, <laughs> but no, it was it was entirely Bill and Ted. It was it was the scene where mm-hmm. they said, "Let's we can't forget to leave the keys right here." Right? <laughs> are, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me right now? Um, outside, Primal tries to break into the temple and is approached by Starscream and Black Arachnia. Primal reluctantly proposes to an alliance to break inside, just as Beast Megatron arrives, chastising the Spider for conspiring with Maximal with a Maximal. Beast Megatron easily swats Starscream and Black Arachne aside and clashes with Primal. Primal seeks revenge for the 200 Maximals lost during his mission and is aided by the arrival of uh, the other Autobots and Maximals. Primal uses the distraction to seek a way into the temple. Right on cue, the spirit of Dinobot arrives and, <laughs> God, and combines with Primal, briefly making him intangible. Primal steps through the temple and sees Prime knocked unconscious by Megatron and tackles the Decepticon. Half dazed, Prime sees Alita in a bizarre landscape, helping him to his feet. She begs him to win the battle by surrender, advice that Prime struggles to understand or agree with. He snaps awake and tells Primal to stand down, offering the Matrix to Megatron, who takes it greedily. He is granted entrance into the temple's tower and is immediately greeted with a vision. Megatron sees himself back on Cybertron at Decepticon headquarters, presiding over a legion of cheering Decepticons, but in a flash, the Matrix turns red, rejecting him. The adoring Decepticon crown suddenly becomes sparkless, and once again, Megatron Megatron is drawn to the void. As Primal questions Prime's judgment, the central tower opens up, and the two are urged inside by Alita's voice. Prime and Primal find themselves in an infinite corridor. The Matrix floats back to Prime, and suddenly the room goes dark, and the two leaders are surrounded by sparks, merging with the all-spark to sustain it. Primal is taken aback by the unity of Predacon and Maximal Sparks. Finally, the Allspark compresses itself into a polyhedral shape in Prime's hand, and the temple becomes infused with a blinding light. The temple dissolves, and the Prime hover and Prime hovers in the sky as the golden disc lies among the debris on the ground. So this was kind of trippy. Yes. Not as, not as trippy as the dinosaur spaceship episode from last season when they first went into the dead zone or whatever it was. Right. But but still kind of trippy. Yeah, it was um it was definitely hinged more on the like the spiritual elements mm-hmm. that they added in Beast Wars with the sparks and the you know the souls of transformers and dealing with all that stuff. But most of it was just even taking that into account, it was pure garbage. Yeah. Yeah. Having I, I think they bit off more they can chew by making this 18 episodes. This, I feel like they could have done the entire story they were trying to tell in 10, 22 minute episodes and we're yes. done. Yes. Um, this is feeling dragged out. Yeah. The I other- mean, this, this battle of, well, I've got it now. No, I've got it now. Well, I've got a force field dog. Well, I've got a dinosaur that eats force field dogs. The one positive thing I will say here is I did like, the i the idea and it's tropey but tropes are but you know tropes are what they are you know because they work and that is megatron finally has all that he wants and then he sees a vision of the future and it, nothing nothing works out for him mm-hmm. um also a very christian tenement about you know don't the, the fighting is not always the answer sometimes it, you know the whole thing was if you just give uh megatron the the matrix and the all spark he'll see for himself this isn't going to work out for him Mm -hmm. and because they haven't made megatron a complete lunatic he does come to that realization 
uh, which I thought was nice, you know, because, especially because they wrote Prime here as such a kind of grunty soldier type. And and so, like, I can buy him not understanding the idea of, like, sometimes the answer is to not fight. Sometimes people just need to see for themselves. Right. You know, right. and we'll, we'll, you'll eventually get to where you need to be if you just let people get there themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there, there definitely was. There's something to be said about that. And there's that that in and of itself added so much to this series uh, just the just that idea of you win by not fighting. Yeah, for sure. All right, episode five here. Uh, who start to wind things down inside the arc? Will Jack thinks the ship is ready for takeoff, but Ratchet strongly disagrees. Rhinox take Ratchet's side and advises caution as they debate. Bumblebee arrives on the bridge with excellent news. Optimus Prime has the all spark. Hooray! Mm -hmm. And so they have no time to waste getting back to Cybertron. Wheeljack takes this as a sign to punch the ignition. Suddenly, the arc quakes inside the unstable volcano, jostling around the skeleton crew. Rhinox tries to restore stability, but Teletran fails to respond. Slamming the control console with his fist, the arc powers down, and disaster is averted for the time being. Rhinox hears an unintelligible mumbling from Teletran again, which perplexes him. Uh, back in the wilderness, Optimus Prime and Optimal Prime, Optimus Primal, rather, Return victorious with Prime holding the AllSpark. The Autobots and Maximals rush to their leaders in excitement. Unfortunately, Prime is bad news, because of course he does. The AllSpark is dying, because of course it is. Having spent too much time apart from Cybertron, Prime barely has time to urge everyone to return to the Ark before being ambushed by Megatron and Beast Megatron. Prime refuses to relinquish the AllSpark to Megatron. Opposing factions have a standoff. I feel like we settled this in the last episode, but okay, right. sure. <laughs> <laughs> everything we learned in the last 22 minutes gone yeah go off again. i guess yeah uh close by starscream watches the 10 situation black arachnia uses her synthetic webbing to construct a facsimile of a device that can read the golden disc with a sample of megatron's energon she's able to generate his unique energy signature allowing them to both listen to the disc's secret starscream realizes that black arachnia urged him earlier to take the crown from megatron for the primary purpose of stealing megatron's energon Angered, he attacks Black Arachnia and flies away with the golden disc and its listening device. Now a safe distance away, he listens to the disc. And this is the good part. He hears Megatron's moment of triumph against Optimus Prime, though he himself is mortally wounded. But Megatron is suddenly summoned to Unicron and forced into a... a obeisance. A, obeisance. Thanks. No uh, Unicron saves Megatron by giving him a new body, that of Galvatron. Starscream has no pity on the enslaved Galvatron and begins to gloat when a voice in the disc speaks to him uh, in Unicron's voice. He is told to listen closely. Black Arachnia catches up to Starscream and gives him an earful, calling him a backstabbing coward. But the easily provoked Seeker is silent and the lack of banter worries her. Starscream only has urgency in his voice, claiming they have to go immediately. The Autobots and Maximals finally return to the Ark. Prime learns the ship is not cleared for launch yet, but he tells the crew they have run out of time. He orders Wheeljack to get the ship airborne by any means necessary. While Optimus issues these orders, Bumblebee receives a communication from Starscream, of all people. He exits the Ark to give Starscream and Black Arachne a chance to explain themselves. Frenetic and trembling, Starscream wonders of all the wars and suffering have been, by design, caused by a malevolent architect. Possessed with rare insight, he admits his lack of strength, and in order to save Cybertron, entrusts the golden disc to Bumblebee. And Bumblebee shatters the disc, like you do. Yep. Uh, Bumblebee advises his erstwhile enemy to confront the uncertainty of the future with courage. But the words are lost in the sudden rumbling of the volcano. The disturbance was caused by the nemesis moving into attack position above the Ark. Black Arachnia, Starscream, and, Bull and Bumblebee rush inside the Ark for cover. The Ark raises its shield to withstand a Decepticon attack, but the situation remains dire. Prime attempts to reason with Megatron, but Megatron has no intention of destroying the AllSpark, just the Autobots and the Maximals. Primal wants to take the battle, wants to take the battle to the Nemesis. Prime rejects such self-sacrifice. Black Arachnia offers another solution, get her aboard the Nemesis so she can disable all their weapons. The Maximals lead a strike force into the Decepticon flagship and crash through the top of the bridge at, and engaging the Decepticons and Predacons in battle. Primal taunts Beast Megatron for inadvertently serving Galvatron, but the Beast tells Primal that he saved Megatron. Beast Megatron accuses Primal of siding with Nemesis Prime, at least the bot who will become ne uh, Nemesis. But Primal believes in Prime, 
and slams his opponent into a wall. Megatron himself is more than a match for the Maximals and even manages to lift and toss a charging Rhinox aside. Shortly afterwards, the Maximals are defeated. Uh, Air Razor dispatches Black Arachnia to carry out her sabotage mission defense her while she hacks the ship's systems. The pressure rises as Air Razor is attacked by a small army of Predacon Scorpinox. Meanwhile, in the Ark, Wheeljack and Ratchet desperately try to kickstart the ship's engines, but they fail. In their moment of despair, the Allspark glows and bathes the bridge in light concurrently on the Nemesis as both Megatron... Uh, aim both Megatrons aim their weapons at the fallen primal. Soundwave detects a large energy increase in the arc. Megatron orders Soundwave to destroy the arc quickly with one final shot. But Soundwave cannot, the weapons no longer function due to Black Arachne and Air Razor who battle their way out of the Nemesis. Megatron is unfazed. If his ship lacks a weapon, he will become the weapon, transforming into tank mode and resuming the assault on the arc. Prime realizes that all is lost and orders the crew to abandon ship, but Bumblebee cannot leave. The arc begins shifting, its panels reconfiguring. Megatron's attack is interrupted by Starscream, who attacks him and begs him to stop. Starscream reminds Megatron of his future self's words and how he regretted not joining forces with the Autobots before becoming enslaved by Unicron. He finally reveals to Megatron that Galvatron is his future self and that he is destined to be enslaved, a fact that fills Megatron with shock and revulsion. Still, Megatron is not swayed because... <laughs> Because of course he's not. It's of course he's Starscream. <laughs> and Starscream's transformed into jet form, knocking Megatron off the ship's ramp. Uh, on board the Nemesis, all is still for a moment, but through the mist and ash over the volcano, its titanic form appears. The Ark has transformed into robot mode. And I have to ask, is that a real thing? Did they make a uh, toy that transformed? They did. It's okay. like a billion dollars. It's so expensive. <laughs> and it's huge. It's like you know, bigger than bigger than my cat. Could you actually put Transformers inside of it? Uh, it comes with a little, not like the full size Transformers, but it comes with mm -hmm. a Teletran One computer okay. that transforms into a robot that you okay. can put inside of it. I'm guessing it's like wheelie sized. Kinda. Kinda. Okay. Um. I'm bored. The Nemesis. Thank you. On board the Nemesis, all is still for a moment, but through the mist and ash over the volcano, a titanic... Uh, it grabs the Nemesis and delivers a mighty uppercut to it, crippling the spacecraft. Because when all else fails, just punch a thing. Exactly. <laughs> Black Arachne is thrown off the ship by a large punch, but Air Razor quickly dives after her and saves her from certain doom. Mwah. Yep. <laughs> My hero. There, there it is. A shocked expression covers Air Razor's face from Black Arachne. He says, my hero, and smooches her on the cheek. All righty. As the Autobots watch the Nemesis sink halfway into the lava, Teletran, the Ark, speaks to the stunned Wheeljack. It tells them that it learned of the schematics for its transformation during their time in the dead universe and modified itself accordingly. The Allspark gave it the final jolt it needed to complete its work. Optimus Prime declares the battle over as Teletran holds the defeated and amazed Megatron in its palm. Very soon, Teletran returns to its Ark form, the Decepticons, Predacons, are, uh, save Black Arachnia, are imprisoned within the Ark. Prime and Primal thank each other for their mutual support. Primal and the Maximals prepare for their journey back to Cybertron with the Autobots, even though they could vanish at any moment due to the fact that they are changing their own history. The two leaders pledge to rebuild Cybertron as the Ark takes off, departing for a space bridge near Earth. There is dread along with the anticipation of returning home. Primal wants to tell Prime about Nemesis, and Starscream is horrified by the idea that, of reaching Cybertron, muttering, but that's what he wants! And the arc passes through the space bridge. And finally, we have reached our glorious conclusion. Um, so episode five was fun. You know, yeah. again, I, none, none of these are perfect, but I think, you know, like I said, five, the action picks up. We're not constantly going over the same beats over and over again. There was a lot of good stuff here with Starscream and Megatron. What were some of your thoughts? Um, I really enjoyed episode five. I think if I had to pick one episode out of the whole series to make my like crowning achievement, it would probably be three, mm -hmm. but five is right up there. Um, I liked the uh, siege moment where Air Razor and Black Arachnia are sort of, uh, Air Razor protecting Black Arachnia as they're trying to override the Nemesis systems. That was very tense and very interesting. Mm -hmm. Um I enjoyed the turn in Starscream's character, kind of making him into a, almost a prophet. Yeah. Um, but he's still, the problem with him being the guy who knows everything is he's Starscream and yeah. no one trusts him because 
is Starscream. He will say anything. All right. So I enjoyed that turn. Um, and then just for sheer when <laughs> the arc turns into a giant robot and punches the nemesis. That was, that was really cool. I really enjoyed that. That was very fun. Yep. Um, I wish, you know, I, it, it's, it's especially because they, they made the toy. It's fine. But you know who I miss in this? Uh, we, we get an Omega Supreme. We never get a Fortress Maximus though. Yeah, that's true. We didn't see Fort Max. Um, uh, we got Scorpinoc. missed opportunities. Yeah. We got Scorponok. We got we had Omega Supreme. I don't remember. Did we have the Constructicons on this? Did we have Devastator? No, no, we didn't get any combiners. Okay, but and that's because combining was the gimmick from two toy lines ago. Um, also, no Dinobots. I was, you know, I was really hoping for Dinobots here, and we never got those. Yeah. Um, me Grimlock sad. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know. The problem would be you have a character named Dinobot and a group of characters named Dinobots, and you can't have two characters named the same thing. Oh. <laughs> I was going to say, it would have made for a great who's on verse moment. Oh. Like, what's your name? Dinobot. No, me, Dinobot. No, I'm Dinobot. No, me, Dinobot. <laughs> Somebody better have something to say to me real soon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very busy. That family guy bit. All right. Um, the last episode here, and then we are done with this. The Ark emerges through the space bridge from Earth and jumps through several more dotted throughout the galaxy as Optimus Prime's command. Yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy 2 did a better job with that. Yeah, um, Starscream is hauled over to the stasis field to join the other Decepticons. Prowl is impressed by Black Arachnia stasis technology, but she brushes off his compliment. A terrified Starscream tries to... Excuse me. Trying to warn the Autobots that the dangers he foresaw from the Golden Disk before the stasis field temporarily deactivates him. As the Ark's crew emerges from the final space bridge, they are shocked to find themselves in the dead universe once again because they had made a left turn at Albuquerque. Oh, as you do. Ominous purple matter consumes the ship and teleports it to Cybertron in the present day, a metal wasteland trapped in perpetual snowstorms. The Ark violently crash lands like it does on the planet's surface, but the ship's crew thankfully survive the landing owning to owing to Rhinox's initiating the ship stabilizers. Before. Okay, sure. The Autobots in Max. I have a question. Yes, sir. Where's the snow come from? The atmosphere. Why is there water on a metal planet? That's a very good question. <laughs> I mean, my my Initial answer is, well, water is the spark of all life, but these are robots, and how does that track? It, it just it occurred to me when I was watching this. I'm like, wait, I would get a rust storm. A rust storm would be cool, yeah. but snow? Yeah, I don't know how much thought they put into it. They were just like, we just need to, we need to show that the planet is dying. Yeah, there and, you go. You know, and so post-apocalyptic, you know, the, the life bleeding out of the planet, and so inclement weather. Yeah, just make it snow. It's fine. Yeah, it's sorry. fine. We'll we'll fix it in post. <laughs> um, a frustrated Bumblebee shortly follows Optimus against his orders and scolds him for taking the old spark heading off without backup. Uh, which actually I think is a great conversation between them. It's sort of like, hey, asshole, <laughs> what? You don't have to do this by yourself. You haven't had to do this by yourself this whole time. Why are you choosing now to be this way? Right. Um. The, the small Autobot reminds him that it's his duty to provide balance to Optimus' decision-making. <laughs> yes, I have to stop this lunatic from going off the deep end. Optimus expresses no criticism towards Bumblebee's words and admits he still feels remorse about his part in dooming Cybertron. And giant eye roll from the audience. All right, we get it. All of our heroes are dumb. Um, we get it. You did the thing. It sucked. <laughs> Let's move on. Bumblebee tells Optimus that accusing himself is unproductive. No shit. <laughs> <laughs> Reviving Cybertron is what Optimus' crew cares about the most, and so does the audience. Optimus stumbles upon uh, the lifeless husk of Alita 1. It was a really gruesome scene. Very sad, by the way. Very sad. And uh, was really, I was kind of disappointed that that was all we saw, other than the AllSpark illusions mm -hmm. that was all we saw of alita one for all of kingdom is like oh well we got back and she's dead because everyone's dead and it's so funny because like they're robots they don't really have skeletons but they somehow made her look skeletal they did they did a really good job it was yeah. uh the the detailing on the rust on her and whatnot mm -hmm. 
Um, he falls to his knees in grief, blaming himself for her demise. Bumblebee gently reminds Optimus of the importance of returning the Allspark to Cybertron and tells him there's no time to dwell on Alita's sacrifice. Meanwhile, in the Ark, Galvatron frees Megatron from his stasis in the Ark and tells him to prepare for, fi- for the final battle. None of that made any sense to me, by the way. How oh. Galvatron... How Galvatron was able to get there from the future. Well, it's or the it's dead the zone future or whatever it was of the it. past, but it's th- the present, but it's the future. I mean, it's the Maximals present, but it's the future. Oh no, I've gone cross-eyed. <laughs> yeah, there's smoke coming out of your ears. Let's just move on. <laughs> <laughs> um Optimus's Matrix be- beacon guides him to the Allspark Temple on Cybertron when Bumblebee Expresses surprise, Optimus reminds him that the Allspark is capable of hiding the temple from the naked eye. Bumblebee then responds he was actually referring to the canyon standing between them and the tower. I feel like in the dialogue of this thing and the character interaction, at this point, the writers were all fighting with each other. Oh, totally. And there, <laughs> were, there were probably a few um, soda pops involved. Sure. That only an extremely powerful entity could have created. Optimus Prime's vile alter ego, Nemesis Prime, appears on the opposite side of the crevice when whom Optimus suspects was responsible for creating the canyon in the first place. I have questions about this. Okay. Because did they actually make a Nemesis Prime toy? Yes, kind of. Okay. They released a... For each season, they released a spoiler box. Okay. Um, it was uh, completely opaque, looked like an ammo crate mm-hmm. um, that you would open up and then you would reveal the character inside and it would be a spoiler for that season of, of the show. Gotcha. And the spoiler for um, Siege was Ultra Magnus and that foreshadowed Ultra Magnus being killed. Gotcha. The spoiler for Earthrise was Nemesis Prime. Okay. <laughs> like, I guess there's that one scene in Earthrise where they show a close-up of Optimus's face and it goes dark. But other than that, what the hell did he have to do with Earthrise? And now here he is. It's okay. kind of like, it feels, it felt to me like they were like, oh, wait, shit. We were going to do Nemesis Prime. Oops. So I have more questions. <laughs> okay. At the beginning of this, Optimus Primal makes reference to Nemesis Prime. Was Nemesis Prime a character in Beast Wars? No. Okay. (laughs) Was this character wholly invented for this series? Kind of. (laughs) Um, There there is a history of evil Optimuses called Nemesis Prime. Okay. But this version being a corrupted by Unicron version of Optimus Prime, sort of a counterpart to Galvatron, that's new as far okay. as I know. I've never run into that before. Okay. This also feels like they ran out of characters and they were yes. like, throw black paint and call him evil Optimus and we'll and it'll be fine. It was it was purely a uh, a nostalgia thing because there have been black repaints of it's actually the black repaint is actually a thing in the Transformers fandom Mm -hmm. where that's the bottom of the barrel. That's when you can tell they're scraping the bottom of the barrel for a toy line is when we start getting the same figures, but they're black now. Do you remember in age of extinction where they took the remains of Megatron, turned him into Galvatron and Galvatron was a black truck? Yes. (laughs) Yes, I do. And many a Transformer fan took their pants and threw them directly at the screen. Yes. I believe I was one of them. <laughs> um, that said, I need very much need the, I think it's a snort tease or it might be like, it might be uh, an eighties tease thing, whatever, whatever of the nine zillion t-shirt companies that are out there. It's the picture of Optimus prime, but he's Brown and it says Amazon prime. Yes. I I've need seen that, that. I've seen that. That is uh that is <laughs> it's perfect. All right, moving on. Um, Megatron realizes Galvatron is his future alter ego. <sighs> Megatron's a bit slow. I Gal- mean, <laughs> he's got to figure it out sometime. Let him work it out. <laughs> but Galvatron brushes off this comparison. Uh, Galvatron recounts his creation, 
by his omniscient master Unicron, who torches him even if he glances at the Allspark. Megatron realizes Galvatron's plan is to seize the... I gotta stop this for a second. So, if you're a fan of Transformers, the Unicron thing and his ominous nature makes a total degree of sense. Because we all saw the movie, we saw him we, you know, we saw him devour planets. Here's the problem. You have to treat these shows like nobody's ever seen these before. So, let's take like, like my son as an example. Yeah. If he's never seen Transformers before and he's watching this for the first time because his crazy father was like, you're gonna love Transformers all boys did when we were your age. If you don't see Unicron do anything, right? Where's the menace and the tension coming from? He's a big ball. He's a big ball in space who has a deep voice and turns things into other things. And that's about it. Right. Wouldn't it have made more sense to spend like there were two things that they don't do in this that I wish they had. One, we needed to spend some time with Unicron bearing down on Cybertron like the movie does it really well. He eats the one planet full of like robot scientists and shit, mm -hmm. right? Right at the beginning of the movie. It yeah. opens with that. That's the cold. Yeah, it's like right there. Uh, as the movie progresses, he makes his way to Cybertron and he eats the two moons. And in the movie's conclusion, he finally gets to Cybertron and transforms for no apparent reason. Um, <laughs> but that's either here nor there. Uh, they don't do any of that here. And so Unicron is brought out to be this big giant menace. And again, this is why I thought, well, okay, surely you're going to start to see Unicron start to eat the planet, and you're going to have Cybertron, like, get the Allspark and fight back. None of those things happen. And so I'm left wondering, what's all this nonsense about Unicron for, then? And before you weigh in on that, the other thing was, I wish we had gotten to know the Beast Wars guys a little bit more, in mm -hmm. that... We just kind of opened with them blindly attacking the Autobots. And, in st and even if you still want to open that way, I kind of wish we had gotten an episode of what happened leading up to that moment with the, you know, oh, however many years they were there. I wish we could have gotten sort of the quick and dirty history of how the Beast Wars came to be and how they got to that point. Because again, I don't think you get to know them. You get to know them over the course of the episodes in present day but you don't get any sense of who these people were before all that happened. Right. Um, I think, and this is going to be an unpopular opinion among uh, fans of this series. I think most of Earthrise, if not all of Earthrise could be cut mm -hmm. and replaced with a, like you do, you do a series, you do siege explaining the Autobots and the Decepticons you do, we'll call it Earthrise, explain the Maximals and the Predacons. And then you do Kingdom, you merge them together. Yeah, that would have been fine. You really did not need Earthrise as it was done, which is basically just them running through space. Which you and I talked about it with Sean, I think, at the time. And yeah. we were all like, what was the point of any of this other than they kept kicking the Allspark down the field? Yep. Yeah, exactly. You know? It was I, just, it was just a a delay tactic. It felt yeah. like. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, um, Megatron asserts that the all spark true purpose is revitalizing Cybertron and knows that destroying Unicron may come at the expense of his planet. Don't see how that connects. Galvatron couldn't care less about their home world's well being. However, tells Unicron may consider punishing them both if they don't move quickly. Yeah. This got way up its own ass. It really um, did. As Optimus Prime and Bumblebee stare down Nemesis Prime, Optimus realizes his evil future self converged with the present to take the Allspark from his heroic counterpart. Noticing Bumblebee carrying the Allspark down the cliffside, Nemesis jumps high into the air and rains lasers on the small Autobot, only to be distracted by Optimus returning the volley. Optimus Primal and Prowl wander into the Ark's Decepticon stasis room. Recognizing that a glitch registered in the stasis field, Primal realizes that Megatron is missing from the stasis field. Outside the Ark, Megatron and Galvatron rain laser fire on opposing Autobots and Maximals and Prowl and Primal shortly engage the enemies. However, Cheetor, Tigatron, and Air Razor use their beast modes to gain the upper hand against the two Decepticons who retreat into the distance. Optimus Primal fears that Galvatron will have heavy backup with him. Uh, as Bumblebee climbs down the face of the cliff, Optimus and Nemesis have a grueling fist fight on the surface. With the latter eventually overpowering his opponent, Nemesis coldly demands the Allspark from Optimus, kicking him down when his heroic former self replies he doesn't have it. 
Nemesis refuses to take no for an answer and claim no means no Nemesis and claims Megatron was just as weak as Optimus is now. Prior to his rebirth by Unicron, seething with hatred for Chaos Bringer, Nemesis reveals his plan to destroy Unicron, leading Optimus to understand why Nemesis needs the All Spark so badly. Optimus refuses to lower his guard against Nemesis, only to be blasted by Galvatron from afar. As Megatron, Galvatron, and Nemesis Prime stand united, Optimus refuses to give in to his foe's demands for the All Spark. Galvatron tries to disorient Optimus by telling him that his and Nemesis' existence is the result of of the All Sparks demise, but Optimus will never give up on restoring Cybertron. Oh my fucking god! Just do it already. Yeah, seriously, seriously. It's, this is a it's... twenty-two minute show. It feels longer than Lord of the Rings. <laughs> um, god, Optimus Primal arrives and chimes in that life was miserable under Unicron's presence. How? Why? Show when show me. And this Cybertron is the home they must protect now. <sighs> the united factions of Autobots, Maximals, Decepticons, and Predacons arrive under Primal. Upon hearing Optimus and Starscream's encouragement to fight for the survival of Cybertron, which is presently not under attack by anything. Jesus Christ. Unless you count, unless you count Galvatron and Nemesis just being there, being under attack. It's really not at all. I'm watching this and I'm desperately waiting for Unicron to attack the planet and he's just chilling. Yeah, he's he's off. He's he had a uh he had to get his nails done. He's on the pot reading the economist. <laughs> <laughs> Megatron turns on his future self with his fusion Unicron seems like a guy that would read the economist, right? Yeah, oh totally. Okay. Totally. Megatron turns on his future self with his fusion cannon aimed at his head. However, Nemesis sneak attacks Megatron, and together with Galvatron, they effortlessly, effortlessly, effortlessly rather, fight off the Maximals and Predacons during the ensuing battle. Having reached the bottom of the trench, Bumblebee spots a door leading to the Temple of the Allspark at the cliff surface. surface. He begs to be led inside, eventually activating the door to the temple with his emotional pleas. Because that's how locks work. Right. Clearly. Nemesis senses the all spark moving into the temple and jumps off to said location to everyone's awe. The golden spirits of countless de- <laughs> God. That's a sentence right there. <laughs> the golden spirits of countless deceased Cybertronians and the uh, uh, order of water buffalo descend to the top of the tower and rest on the cliff side. Yes, this is where we get our dramatic, you know, uh, encore here, where everyone who's been in this show shows up. Yep. Bumblebee reaches the All Sparks altar and places the All Spark in a trifle place, only for the ancient artifact to seemingly die at the last second. Galvatron and Nemesis leap to attack the Cybertronian spirit, but the spark of Alita One uses a mystical power to teleport the malevolent duo away, like you do. Because that's a thing that she can do now. Yeah, sure. Force Ghost. Um, Alita One appears to Optimus, who begs her for forgiveness. Oh my God, Optimus, buddy, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta lay off. And in We're the done. next scene, the Autobots and Decepticons take turns chainsawing Optimus's penis off. Um, Jesus Christ! Alita tenderly ensures him. <laughs> assures him that his actions were ultimately the only option he had, and he professes her love for him. The Golden Sparks rejoin the Allspark, reviving it and ending the Cybertronian's eternal winter. <laughs> With the planet fully restored, okay. the Autobots, Maximals, Decepticons, and Predacons resolve their ongoing war and build a statue. <laughs> sure. Right, because that's the first thing you're going to do. Depicting a Decepticon and an Autobot soldier standing together back to back. Megatron agrees to end hostilities with the Autobots, but refuses to shake Optimus's hand, stating that for now the world is large enough for them to live apart. As the Decepticons walk away, Starscream warns Black Arachnia that he senses Unicron is still at large, to which Black Arachnia chivalrously replies they will be ready for him as soon as he shows himself. Which was a stupid way to end this. Yes. In the depths of space, Unicron torments Galvatron and Nemesis for their failure. He warns them he has ideas inspired by the dead universe and swallows up the two in his great maw as he reformats them. So you're like a big 
Transformers person. Anyone left that they haven't shown that they could turn them into? Nope. Okay. Nope. And uh, as a oh, let's let's call let's call it what it is. As a big Transformers nerd, this is over. Yeah. Like I I as soon as I saw this ending, I'm like, oh, they're sneaky. They're going to do a fourth one. I looked into it. Nope. Hasbro's already moving on to the next uh, to the next lineup, and there's no plans for any further Netflix series or anything like that. So, nope. It's just a it's a sequel bait ending that has no sequel to it. Um, does IDW or Marvel currently have the licensing for comic books? IDW does, um, but there's some rumors going around that I Marvel might buy IDW here in the near future. Because the comics industry is not what it used to be, and uh, IDW does a lot of licensed work. They do like the Marvel Adventures books mm-hmm. and the Star Wars Adventures books. They do those for Marvel. So there's rumors going around that Marvel's just going, the mouse is just going to buy them up. But right now, IDW has the license. Okay. Nobody buy AfterShock Comics. They're the only company putting stuff out that I'll actually buy. Um, <laughs> because <laughs> I like indie comics. Um, anyway, so my only thought with that is that uh, I'm guessing maybe this continues in the comics. No. Um, no, that's it. We're done. They closed the we're, book on this. We are, we are done, though. Uh, there is currently a regular Transformers comic and a Beast Wars comic, neither of which connect to this in any way, shape, or form. So they wrote this asshole ending with no other way to conclude it, and they just left it open-ended for no apparent reason. Yes. Awesome. Your final thoughts, sir. That is my final thought. They left an <laughs> asshole opening, an asshole ending open. Um, my final thoughts on Kingdom and on the War for Cybertron trilogy as a whole. Like I said, at the end of the day, I'm glad I watched these series. Sure. I enjoyed quite a bit of what they had to offer. That being said, I agree with you. They could have cut out a lot of filler and spent that time building the characters up more organically, showing us rather than just telling us what the Maximals and Predacons were all about. Um, I think you could have done away with the entire second act and replaced it, like I said. Mm. But am I mad that I watched the War for Cybertron trilogy? No, it entertained me. I, um, I had a decent time watching mm-hmm. it and talking about it with you. So can't be too mad. Yeah. I mean, it was fine. My only other comment about this is I don't know whose kids watch this. Oh, no um, ones. Okay. And so I think they might have done a, I think they might have done better if they had just forgone the kid audience. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm not saying it had to be like hard or hard R you know, we needed a scene of like Hound and RC banging in like the room or whatever. But um, I am saying that maybe don't do a series, do a two hour adult oriented Transformers movie with the same elements to it. And so a little less MacGuffin talk and a little more characterization. So make make, make an adult, not a, adult, but make a movie for our age group um, that deals with these characters in a dramatic way that you and I can, you know, can really engage with because again, you know, and this is what I said about GI Joe a couple of weeks back. I'm not entirely sure there's an audience for the stuff that we grew up with anymore. There's more of an audience for transformers than there is GI Joe. I think GI Joe is beyond dead, but I think for like the kids that are my, my kid's age, I don't, you know, the transformers has some resonance because who doesn't like robots, robots Mm -hmm. and dinosaurs are huge. Mm -hmm. Um, that those things never die, but I don't know how many kids are necessarily into transformers right now or would have been into this show. And so why not just bite the bullet and make it for, make it for the adult audience that watches this kind of shit on Netflix. Right. Yeah. I think the best word that could be used for what this should have been is mature. Yes. It should have been a mature series for fans of the previous, uh, properties and given them the kind of storytelling that we as adults look to rather than trying to use it as a vehicle to sell toys Mm -hmm. because your audience for that cartoon already exists 
and you're competing with yourself. There is another cartoon of Transformers. Mm -hmm. It's called like Cyberverse or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's very Bumblebee fo focused and the kids love it and the toys sell like hotcakes. Mm -hmm. And then you've got these ones. The toys for this were even aimed at the adult collectors. Mm -hmm. There was the Generations line, which is Hasbro's way of, you know, making us feel like we're not buying little shitty $20 pieces of plastic. Um, but they tried to market it two ways and they, it didn't work out for them. I don't think the only one of these that I've seen so far that Netflix really had a handle on was She-Ra. Yeah. She Shira was super good. She-Ra knew its audience. She-Ra knew exactly what it wanted to be. And, you know, and only the people who have problems with, the existence of homosexuality seemed to have right. had issues with that show. Right. Everybody else was like, got it immediately. You know, I loved it. Alexis loved it. And we were about seven years apart. And my daughter loved it. And she's freaking 10. Right. So, like, that is the only one I have seen where whoever was handling it handled it appropriately. This one was not a swing and a miss, but definitely kind of fair to Midland. And then we talked about He Man before, where, you know, Boy, when uh, we're eventually going to talk about the He-Man show, and and we're going to have to spend an extra hour just deconstructing Kevin Smith and all of his various psychoses. <laughs> <sighs> I have never seen a man with a hot wife and a grown daughter still crave the attention of women in my life so badly as Kevin Smith. Oh, oh, Kevin uh, Smith! <laughs> my God. Uh. You're like a famous director, married, and have a full-grown adult daughter who's also an actress. Get a hold of yourself. Come and on. that's, Come and on, that's my final word on Transformers. Right, yeah. <laughs> what? Rattling broadcasting. What did you think about Transformers? Get a hold of yourself, Kevin Smith. <laughs> All right, sir. Thanks for doing this with me. This was fun. Um, we'll have to figure out uh, how to get you back on here. I know... Um, I want to take a moment though and say thank you for not only doing this, but also all hell Megatron um, and the, uh, the transformers uh, my little pony book uh, over the course of the year, I've had to take over doing source material and that is finally coming to a glorious end. Okay. Uh, Jesse is taking back over. Mm -hmm. um, he started already with JLA Titans, the Texas imperative. And then as in, in September, He's back full time, um, so all the comic book stuff goes back to him. But for you and Christian and Alexis Haina um, and Ben Cologne and for everybody that helped out with comic books, I really appreciate it. And so I just want to say thank you. Oh, no problem. That's that's what I'm here for. All right. All right, man. I hear you do uh, some twitching and shouting. Tell them all about it. I do. Um, you can find me over at twitch.tv slash the film twit. I am a variety streamer, which means that I even I don't know what I'm doing from day to day. Um, but, uh, we play games, we have fun, we tell jokes, we, uh, we grow as people. <laughs> Perfect. And you can check out, as I said, myself and Cole review All Hell Megatron. Myself and Alexis Haina did, um, My Little Pony Transformers Friendship is Magic, which was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, there's another book I think that's currently out and I told Jesse to contact you guys and see if uh, you also wanted to do it mm -hmm. um, and I think you've been on some other I think you were on the Revolution show with us ways back yeah I was on a couple of other Transformers adjacent properties over the course of the uh, over the course of the various different series I was on Revolution I did one other that I can't remember what it was mm -hmm. um, some Transformers comic or TV show or something so, yeah, if you liked in, here in Cole, we did the first two uh, series of this. We did uh, Siege and Earthrise, so those are up in the archives. Myself and, Speaking of comic books, myself and Alexis Hanna reviewed Vote Loki today. We'll be doing the review for the TV show on Wednesday night. We'll also be reviewing um, Free Guy tomorrow. And uh, you can check out myself and Jason Teasley reviewing Fatherhood, Good on Paper, and Lockdown on a Triple Feature. That's it. That's our show. Thanks for joining us uh, for Cole Marin Tet, the film twit, the film twit, right? You got it. Uh, the film twit. I'm Mark Rattledge. Be well, be safe, and behave. <laughs>